Hello, good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Using Compost for Ecological Sanitation in Haiti to Mitigate and Adapt to Climate Change. I'm Brenda Platt, the Director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Composting for Community Initiative, and I'll be your host and facilitator today. This webinar is the fourth in our series focused on compost climate connections. I am so thrilled that we had more than 200 people register from 33 US states plus District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, in addition to 11 other countries that include New Zealand, Uganda, Brazil, Mexico, Trinidad and Tobago, Albania, Romania, and Jordan. So welcome all. Um, we're very thrilled about this one. It is. Um, uh, the fourth one, as I said, our first one uh, back in September was with Dr. Sally Brown of the Washington um, State University, and she focused on how compost sequesters carbon and delivers other benefits. And that was followed by Calla Rose Ostrander, who talked about carbon farming. Our last one featured Dr. Jessica Chiartist, who talked about the new UC Davis research on how compost and cover crops sequester soil carbon. Um, after today's, we have one more schedule. That's carbon farming trials in Colorado with Dan Mesh of EcoCycle and Mark Easter with the Natural Resource Ecology Lab. That's for Tuesday, November 19th. Um, they will be talking about uh, carbon farming pilot projects they've established that adapt the science used in the Marin Carbon Project in California for the Rocky Mountain climate. And that webinar will explore two of the pilot projects now underway on Boulder County and City of Boulder Agricultural Open Space. Since you've registered for this webinar, we'll send you information on that upcoming one, but you will need to register for it. And I'm pleased to share that we opened registration for that one this morning. So um, I also just want to let people know that in addition to this series, we offer other webinars on a wide range of sub, uh, topics related to composting, where we share working models and tips for replication. And many of those other uh, webinars focus on supporting community scale composting. We're not really going to be addressing today the importance of a distributed and diverse infrastructure for composting. So I just want to say a word now that we here at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance support a network of decentralized facilities and businesses, you know, that includes home composting, community scale, on-farm, as well as commercial scale. And not only can community scale operations be brought on faster than their industrial scale counterparts, but they play a vital role in building community equity, returning compost to local soils, and engaging and educating the community. And I will say out of the, of the series we've offered on compost climate connections that today's webinar will showcase this more than any other in this, in this series. So, um, Go to our webinars, they're recorded, check them out. Um, as the next page shows just how you do that, you go to ILSR slash composting. On the right, you'll see composting resources. Scroll down till you see the webinars, um, and then click on that, and you'll get to them all. And before we get started with today's feature presentations, I'm going to ask uh, you a, full, a few polling questions. The first one is simply, did you join or listen to the recording of any webinar in this compost climate connection series and so not any of the other ones but the one on climate um, then we're going to ask a few questions based on the information that dr chartis jessica shared with us last month on the last webinar so have you joined any of the compost climate connection series and we should usually like to see that closer to 80 percent of you have voted getting close to that Okay, let's see the results. So two thirds, um, two thirds for on a previous one and one third of you have new, welcome. Um, now we're gonna ask a few questions as I said, just uh, what we learned from um, uh, the last month's webinar that Dr. Chertis shared on digging deeper, how compost and cover crops sequester soil carbon. So the first question is, what percentage of soil organic matter is dead microbial bodies? Right 
I need a few more of you to participate. Keep going. Try to get to 80% of you voting. So close. All right, we got a good spread here. Let's see the results. So, well, it's not 30 to 50%. It's actually 50 to 80%. So a little bit more than one third of you hit guessed right or knew that one. Okay, so the next question are, what are the benefits of soil aggregation? And here you can select all that apply. So soil aggregation involves the binding together of soil particles. And again, these were these were all information that came out of the last webinar, and there was a lot of information. So um, check it out; you'll learn a whole lot more. All right, let's let's see the results. All right, well, I think all of you selected all of them. That is correct. Soil aggregation, which compost improves, is um, does all of these things. All right, next question. By how much do we need to increase the quantity of carbon contained in soils in order to halt the increase of atmospheric carbon dioxide? Select one. Give you another few seconds. Okay, let's see. Well, interestingly enough, it's the 0.4%. So um, seems like seems like that might be actually doable, huh? Okay, last question. Uh, for every 1% increase in soil organic matter. A soil can hold how much extra water? Select one. And the point here they're asking this is that compost is one of the best ways to add organic matter to soil. So that's the connection here. All right, let's share the results. Looks like most of you were correct, or the one that had the um, highest percentage, 44%. For every 1% in soil organic matter, soil can hold 20,000 gallons of extra water per acre. That came out of Jessica's talk. So uh, look forward to you joining. Uh, the next webinar will be asking questions based on today's webinar. So you guys are all going to get A plus on those. OK, so while we're um, uh, giving um, controls over to Sasha, uh, let me introduce her. Since 2006, SOIL, which stands for Sustainable Organic Integrated Livelihoods, a nonprofit organization in Haiti, has been incubating climate positive sanitation solutions in frontline communities across the, across the country, across Haiti. And these solutions are designed to counter the impacts of poor waste management and offer a restorative, restorative alternative to business as usual practices. Dr. Sasha Kramer, the executive director of SOIL, is going to discuss how SOIL expands access to household sanitation services and transforms the waste they collect into re rich agricultural grade compost while also creating a revolutionary social business model and economic opportunities in some of the world's most under resourced communities and i just want to share that after hurricane dorian hit the bahamas this past august I immediately thought of soil's amazing emergency response, uh, sanitation response um, that they did in the wake of the 2010 earthquake that devastated Haiti. And I think, as you'll hear from Sasha, that soil's work and arc over the last decade surely is a model for other frontline communities that are facing natural and, and man-made um, disasters. Mm -hmm. Sasha is going to be followed by a Dr. Rebecca Riles, Rebecca, who is an assistant professor at the University of California at Merced. And Becca's going to share the results of her newly published paper, co-authored by Soil, 
on the climate benefits of soils ecological sanitation services. So I'm so thrilled to have Sasha and Becca join us today. Um, a reminder that you can type in questions at any time into your GoTo panel, GoToWebinar panel. And um, Sasha, before you get started, I just want to say another word about you, that you're an ecologic ecologist and human rights advocate who's been living and working in Haiti since 2004. Uh, Sasha received her PhD in ecology from San Stanford University in 2006, which is the same year she co-founded SOIL. And while she spends the majority of her time living and working in Haiti, she is also a global advocate for urban sanitation access and the recycling of nutrients and human waste. And her work with her colleagues at Soil has earned recognition from multiple groups. National Geographic named her an emergent explorer. She was the 2014 Schwab Foundation Social Entrepreneur of the Year and the recipient of the Sarf Pata Sanitation Prize for a Lifetime Achievement, just to name a few. So congratulations, Sasha. Uh, Sasha will speak for about 35 minutes, followed by uh, Becca, who's going to speak for about 25 minutes, which should leave us plenty of time for Q&A. So Sasha, take it away. Oh, thank you so much, Brenda. You're making me blush. And I also, I will warn you all that I'm, I'm having technological challenges today. And this uh, online webinar is really going to test my skills. So I ask for patience with that. But I want to say that it is such a pleasure for me to be here speaking today with two women who are great inspirations to me. Both Brenda and Becca are, are people who I deeply admire. And and it's great to see so many women at the forefront of the composting discussion. And it's also wonderful for me to be here because compost was actually the thing that drew me into sanitation. And it's great to feel like I'm, I'm coming back to my roots. Um, my, my interest in ecological sanitation actually started when I was in graduate school. And I was living in the Santa Cruz Mountains and I had this great compost pile in my backyard. And, and I was studying biogeochemistry and I started to really get obsessed with this idea of was there some way that I could get a single nitrogen molecule to actually cycle through my own body twice. Um, and I, I know we've got a lot of compost fanatics out there, so I don't know if any of you have ever thought about this, but I started in an effort to do this. I started um, peeing on my compost pile and and I, as I was doing this, I had, I think I must have been telling my friends, and I had a, a friend of mine who sent me an article about ecological sanitation. And she said, I think, you know, people have already been doing this, actually. And the article was about this amazing scientist living in Zimbabwe named Peter Morgan, who had been working on something called the Arbor Loo, which is a very simple composting toilet where you just dig a small pit in the ground and every time you go to the bathroom you cover it with soil and when the pit is full you you plant a, a tree in that pit and so I got in touch with Peter Morgan and I was lucky enough to have a chance to meet him in 2005 at an ecological sanitation conference in South Africa and that was really the beginning of my my lifetime commitment to doing ecological sanitation work and just to wrap up that story, I actually, I got myself a bit in hot water with this fixation on was I getting nitrogen to cycle back through my body? Because when I defended my dissertation, one of my committee members asked me what the mathematical probability was that that had happened, which I certainly had not prepared for. Um, and luckily we all worked on it together and we figured out that the, the, the likelihood was actually very high. So folks, go out there and pee on your compost and you can get the most local of all the local nutrient cycling going. So I'm going to be speaking to you today about nutrient cycling at a community scale instead of at the scale of, of my individual body. And my talk is going to focus on how ecological sanitation can be used to transform a public health problem into a climate solution and can also be a tool for ensuring that all of those nutrients that are flowing into cities from rural farmlands are actually returned to the soil that they came from. Um, so I'm gonna start by giving a bit of an overview of how my team and I became interested in ecological sanitation in Haiti. 
then I'll, I'll give you an overview of the service that we provide. And then I get to, to finish it off by passing off the baton to Becca so that she can talk about the exciting research that we've been doing looking at the climate impacts of ecological sanitation. All right, folks. So before I get into the meat of my talk, I think that many of you listening have probably read about Haiti. Some of you may have visited Haiti. But I, I think we're all aware that the news that we tend to get from Haiti is generally quite devastating. I think the 2010 earthquake is still very fresh in people's minds. And the images that, that we see tend to be very sad images. So before I get into that, I wanted to show you a short video that I hope will just give you a sense of, of what it is that I love about this beautiful and complex country that I've called home for the last 15 years. So. I have to admit that that video never ceases to make me tear up a little bit. And I think probably more now than ever, because as some of you may have read, Haiti is currently in the midst of another political and economic crisis. And I think that it's during times like these, we, we need to remember what it is that keeps us going. And a lot of what you saw there is the, the spirit of Haiti that keeps our work going what which hopefully won't keep the video repeating there we go so now I'd, I'd like to talk to you about the complex social and environmental factors in haiti that first got us interested in ecological sanitation and one of the things that first drew me to haiti was trying to understand how a country that was once known as the pearl of the antilles became a country where today over 67% of children are malnourished and agricultural production continues to decline. How did a country which once produced two thirds of Europe's tropical produce become a country where the majority of food is imported? A country that is now known as one of the world's most degraded ecosystems. So most explanations of poverty and environmental degradation really focus on contemporary practices like the cutting of trees to create charcoal. And these practices that are necessitated by poverty have certainly played a role in ongoing ecological destruction, but it's critical to look at the historical roots of environmental destruction so that we don't just place the blame on people who have inherit, inherited a legacy, a legacy of colonialism and international intervention that's beyond their control. So some of you may have seen this image before, and this is actually the border of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And this image is often used to, to demonstrate just how badly off Haiti is relative to its neighbor to the east. But what's rarely discussed is the fact that when you're act, what you're actually seeing here are the environmental scars of very different post-colonial histories. In 1804, when Haiti won its independence from France, it set an example to the world, which intimidated slaveholding nations throughout the global north. 
1825, France, with the support of many international allies, insisted that Haiti pay France reparations for their loss of property, which included both the land and the former slaves. Threatened with international isolation, Haiti agreed to pay the debt, which amounted to $27.1 billion in today's currency. It took Haiti over 100 years to pay off this debt to France, and during that time, over 50% of Haiti's forests were chopped down. The few public schools that, that, that existed in the country were closed at the time, and money that should have gone towards infrastructure went instead towards servicing an international debt, one which Haiti has never been completely free of. This is one of the reasons that there is such a stark difference between Haiti and the Dominican Republic, and I think it really serves as an example for why it's important to take a socio-historical perspective when trying to under understand environmental destruction. So having set the historical background, I want to bring us back to contemporary Haiti, and specifically to the places where the land meets the water. When I first flew into Haiti in 2004, I was immediately struck by this brown lip that surrounds Haiti's coastline. And I remember thinking, aha, so that's where all of that fertile soil is going. It's eroding into the ocean from the deforested mountains. But after spending more time in Haiti, I came to realize that it wasn't really only soil that was making the coastline and other body bodies of water brown. It was also human waste. So in Haiti, only 25% of the population have access to a toilet meaning that people are forced to go to the bathroom outside. Or in urban areas, in a plastic bag, which is often disposed of in lots or, or canals. Even in areas where, where there are uh, supplies. Like for instance, this pit latrine, which is built directly over a river where people get water to bathe and cook. This photo is from outside of a very nice rural hospital in Haiti, which has very nice flush toilets. And when I visited the hospital, I asked, where does the water from these flush toilets go when it leaves? And they took me outside and they showed me this deep, deep pit that received all of the water from the toilets. So as you can see, this, this pit is extremely deep. And so during certain times of year, the, the water, the groundwater actually rises up and you get contamination from this hole into nearby wells. So ironically, as soil fertility is declining due to agricultural practices and deforestation, pathogens and nutrients from untreated human waste are leaching into water supplies and contaminating them leading to the de deterioration of aquatic ecosystems and waterborne illness, which is the leading cause of death in children under five. Only recently has Haiti begun to recover from a devastating cholera epidemic, which sickened more than one sixth of the population of the country. So the question for Haiti, and I believe really for the world, is how do we shift this trajectory? How do we take an enormous environmental and public health problem and transform it into an environmental solution? How do we get the nutrients from human waste out of the water and safely onto farmlands where they can be used to reestablish soil fertility? One way to do this is by harvesting the power of simple ecological processes to transform a public health problem into an environmental solution. So before I speak about our, our household sanitation enterprise, I wanna give you a sense of how soil started our ecological sanitation work. When we first launched our program in 2006, we were looking for a sanitation solution that would serve the highest number, number of people for the lowest possible cost. So we started by building free public toilets. The way that it worked was that a community organization would come to us and request a public toilet. We would then raise the money for construction, build the toilet in collaboration with the community, provide a public training, and then hand the toilet over to the community for maintenance. These toilets were elevated double vault composting toilets where one vault is used for a period of time. And when it's filled, you move the toilet seat over to the other vault 
and used that one with the idea that by the time the second vault is filled, the first vault will have had time to compost and you can empty that vault out and use the compost directly on your plants. The, this program went seemingly well for several years before we hit up against several technical and social problems. The technical problems became clear when we tested the contents of the vault and found that although largely decomposed, the waste in the vault still contained pathogens. The social problems were even more serious and that the toilets almost inevitably fell into disrepair over the, over the course of the first couple years. And what we observed is actually a common problem. And I think that it stems from a misperception on the part of development professionals that people who are living in the, with the most need should also have a very high level of volunteerism. So this is the idea that if you need a public toilet in your community, surely the community should be able to come together and manage it. The issue here is that people who are living in vulnerable situations don't have the time to volunteer to clean up someone else's waste. They're struggling just to feed their children. So although it was disappointing to see this model fail, it was also very instructive for us in that we knew that we needed to find a way to safely compost the waste under controlled conditions. And we understood the age old lesson that building something is the easy part. Maintaining it in the long term is the real challenge. We knew that if we were going to create sanitation systems that were sustainably managed, we would need to integrate livelihood generation into our model. We also realized that in order to create sustainable jobs in the sanitation field, people would need to pay a small service fee to use the toilet. And after many discussions, it became clear that people were much more willing to pay for a household toilet than to pay to use a public toilet. So we'll come back to this in a minute. But before that, I wanna talk about one more historical program at Soil that significantly influenced our trajectory. And this is something that Brenda touched on in her introduction. So we first tested a new technological approach to our public toilets in the wake of the 2010 earthquake. So it, at the time of the earthquake, soil was based in Cap Haitian in northern Haiti. And the day after, myself and several of my colleagues went to Port-au-Prince to, to assist with the emergency response. And at the time, we, we did not plan to engage in a sanitation response because to date, our work had really focused on permanent, large public toilets in rural areas, and we knew this would not be appropriate for the conditions in the IDP, IDP camps. However, Oxfam approached us and asked if we would be willing to develop an ecological emergency toilet for use in 33 of the IDP camps that they were managing, which were home to nearly 25,000 people. Using the lessons learned from our public toilet program, we redesigned the double vault toilet to use 15 gallon containers to collect the waste instead of the large permanent vaults. The waste could then be collected weekly and transported to an offsite composting facility for treatment under controlled conditions. Soil ended up constructing 200 toilets and converting thousands of tons of human waste into beautiful compost. From our emergency response work came the idea for a new type of sanitation called container-based sanitation, where containers rather than sewers are used to transport waste out of communities to treatment centers. It was also through our emergency response that we were able to develop our off-site composting system. The container-based toilet and off-site composting system now really serve as the basis for our household toilet enterprise in Cap Haitian. So as we focused on our emergency response in Port-au-Prince, we decided we wanted to use the lessons learned from that the public and emergency sanitation programs to develop a new social enterprise in Northern Haiti. As I mentioned, we were interested in creating a household toilet, which people would be willing to pay for. And we decided to focus on dense urban areas because of the increasing need in our rapidly urbanizing world. Before I show you soil service, I'd like to give a quick overview of some of the challenges faced in urban sanitation and particularly in informal urban settlements and discuss why container-based sanitation is uniquely suited to these environments. 
As we all know, cities are expanding at staggering rates, and the population of people who are living in informal urban settlements is expected to increase from the current 1 billion people today to nearly 2 billion people by 2030. And cities are struggling to expand infrastructure to accommodate this unprecedented growth. This is a satellite image that was taken in Port-au-Prince in January 2010 from a peri-urban peri area just outside of the capital of Port-au-Prince. This is the same image two years later. The informal settlement of Canaran is now said to be Haiti's fourth largest city with a population of 200,000 people. Globally, approximately 60% of people who live in informal urban settlements currently lack basic sanitation facilities. And in Haiti, that percentage is closer to 90%. The current dialogue around citywide sanitation continues to focus on other, either on-site toilets like pit latrines or septic tanks or sewers, but there are very compelling reasons why neither of these techno te technologies will be able to meet the specific needs of rapidly expanding informal settlements. And it's out of this technological void that, that many businesses and organizations around the world have started to look at the potential of container-based sanitation. So one of the primary issues in informal settlements is space. And as you can see here, in many places, there simply is not space to put in a pit latrine or a septic tank. And often there are high water tables, which means that these types of interventions in a very densely populated community don't necessarily block the spread of disease because it's impossible to safely contain the waste. Informal settlements also tend to spring up in areas that are vulnerable because these are the areas yet to be exploited by city planners. As a result, many of these neighborhoods are at risk for natural disasters, such as frequent flooding. And as climate change progresses, the events are, these events are likely to become even more frequent. In dense urban areas that experience frequent flooding, on-site technologies are not safe from a public health perspective. Every time it rains, the waste from pit latrines and poorly sealed septic tanks floods into neighborhoods, contaminating people's homes and personal belongings. And as many of you may recall from the recent hurricanes in the US, even our modern sewer systems are not designed to withstand major flooding. And we saw a lot of images of Miami and Houston underwater that was essentially filled with human waste. Another issue in informal settlements is informality itself. So most people who move into these neighborhoods are renters and they view their situation as temporary. So this makes them unwilling to invest in the upfront costs to put in a pit latrine or septic tank. And because these neighborhoods are informal, governments are resistant to investing in sewer infrastructure as it would mean legitimizing these unplanned communities. Finally, there's the issue of water availability. Sewers and septic tanks are impossible or impractical in many growing urban areas as a result of poor access to water whether it's for physical or economic reasons. So now I'm going to tell you about the meat of my talk, which is uh, Soil's Household Sanitation Enterprise, which is known in Haiti as Echo Lakai. I wanna give you a sense of how this service works, and then I'll pass over to Becca so she can talk more about the exciting scientific research that we've been doing on it. So the toilet itself is a small toilet made of ferro cement um, that is locally constructed and is portable. So it can be placed anywhere inside or outside the home without needing to put in, a, in any special infrastructure. The inside of the toilet has two containers, a gallon jug for urine and a five gallon bucket for the poop. So these toilets are constructed by trained members of the, the communities in which we work, and they cost about $35 to build. One. Sorry, I'm, uh, all, the technological difficulties continue as I am at my parents' house and don't know how their landline works. So if it continues to ring, apologies. Um, so the way that the toilet works is that instead of flushing with water, the users flush with 
a blend of ground agricultural waste, which we call bonnes d'air. The way the service works is the customers subscribe to the service and they agree to pay a small monthly fee of between $2 and $5 per household per month. Households can then choose where to place the toilet, either outside the home or even inside the home um, in many cases. The Echo Lock I team visits each household on our service weekly and we collect the full containers and leave clean, empty containers that contain the, the flushing material or bones are there. The filled buckets are then transferred to the soil poop mobile or to a transfer point at a depot and then they're driven out to one of soil's composting facilities. Containers are received by the, by the compost team who then unload the buckets dump them into the first bins in the composting system, cover that bin with an extra layer of sugarcane bagasse to prevent smell and, and also to prevent flies from coming in contact with the waste. And then we also have a screen that goes over this first bin. So you can see this is a very simple structure built out of pallets and using sugarcane bagasse in the walls to allow aeration. The containers are then taken to a washing area where they're washed with a pressure washer, um, soaked for three minutes in a chlorine solution and set in the sun to dry. So with the compost, the compost site supervisor actually monitors the, the temperature in the bins every day for a two week period to ensure that they, that the waste is, is getting up to a temperature of over 120 degrees Fahrenheit or 50 degrees Celsius for at least seven days, seven consecutive days. And this is the World Health Organization standard for the safe treatment of human waste. The compost is then turned five times over a five month period. And at that point, it's completely decomposed and can be passed through a sieve to remove any garbage or larger chunks of, of organic material. Have beautiful made out of, made out of all of those nutrients coming out of our bodies. Um, before, before we bag the compost, we make sure to test it for the indicator pathogen, E. coli. And if it tests clean, then it is bagged up and sold under the brand name Compost Lakai. The compost is then used either in agriculture or reforestation efforts. And, and again, you know, beyond the, the sort of agricultural implications of using compost, it'll be very exciting for us to see some of the data that Becca has on, on the broader ecological impacts. So before I, I pass off to Becca, I just want to finish up by speaking a little bit about our plans for scale and sustainability. So because we take this full cycle approach to, to sanitation, it allows us to capture revenues at both ends of the service chain. So we collect monthly user fees from households accessing the toilets and one-time charges for compost sales. Although our initial goal was to create a service where user fees and compost sales could cover the full cost of service provision, we quickly realized that, that it was unfair to expect consumers who were living in vulnerable communities to pay the full cost of a service that's heavily subsidized in wealthier countries like the US. Although having a toilet in your home is a private good that people are willing to pay for, managing the waste after it leaves your home is a public service. And therefore there's a real need for public sector financing to close the gap between costs and revenues. So for the past couple of years, we've been in discussions with the Haitian government and the Inter-American Development Bank, or IDB, to develop a financing plan that will increase Ecolakai's scale from 1 to 15% of the population of Cap Haitian over the next five years, while moving us towards this ultimate goal of establishing a public financing me mechanism to ensure that the service can be sustainably financed in the long term. So this graph here, I, I would like to ask you to not focus on the numbers too much because we, we do find that they're shifting regularly. But what this is showing is the, the overall cost of the service. And this orange part at the bottom is the earned revenue from compost sales and user fees. And 
Our discussions to date have really been focusing on how the IDB could work to finance the scale-up of Echo Lakai by passing money through the Haitian government to cover the gap between costs and earned revenues, which is shown here in red, and is currently needing to be raised from grants and, and individual donations. So our hope is that IDB will set up, will, will basically be paying a, a quarterly payment for each toilet added to the service and each ton of waste that is safely treated. And using this type of results-based financing, we can completely cover the costs of providing the service while growing it, reducing costs through economies of scale, and eventually building this bridge to pub long-term public sector mm -hmm. financing, which the discussion is around generating, the public sector will generate the income to cover this sanitation through charging a, a sanitation fee on water bills. And the IDB is also working on setting up a water utility in Capation. I do want to say, I mean, this is a, um, this is ex this is the path that we hope to take to get to our ultimate goal of, of having a sustainable sanitation service. I think that given the political and economic challenges in Haiti right now, this timeline is very ambitious. Um, and in all likelihood, it, it may take a bit longer than it does in our dreams, but ultimately we are committed to realizing this vision and we're we're very grateful to to individuals and organizations that have supported us and will continue to support us along the way. So, because also, as I said, you know, this may take longer than we think, we're looking into, are there other ways that we can generate earned revenue outside of user fees and compost sales? And one of the things that we've been intrigued by is financing through carbon offset programs. And as an ecologist, you know, I, I think that it, it seemed clear that the composting of human waste should be more beneficial to the climate than waste stabilization ponds, which are just essentially giant methane baths. But we needed to really do the rigorous research to see to what extent is thermophilic composting more climate positive than traditional waste treatment. And, and that's where Becca's work comes in. So I'm so excited to, to listen to her share this example of how research scientists can work with implementers to use scientific research as a tool for promoting human rights, environmental stewardship, and social entrepreneurship. Just before I close, I want to share two, two quotes from some of our clients, which to me really signify why this matters. Because while I love all of the different benefits and positive outcomes of this approach, to me personally, it's really about the people. When I met Naderj, one of our customers in Capation, I learned that she and her six children have had an Echo Lac High toilet in their home for several years. Naderj shared that before there were toilets like this, the street was full of waste. Ooh. As more people, now our situation is changing. As more people are signing up for Echo Lakai, someday everyone will have a toilet and our community will be clean. And while most of our customers love the toilet for the convenience and comfort it provides, we have some clients like Bertone who are inspired by what we do with the waste after it leaves the home. Bertone says, we have so many resources being wasted in Haiti. With this toilet, we can change that. So thank you all so much for listening and I look forward to taking your questions later. And if I could ask for just two things of you after seeing this talk, it would be to sign up for our newsletter and follow us on social me the social media platform of your choice. Thank you all so much and I now pass it over to Becca. Yeah, and this is Brenda. I'll just jump in so I can introduce Becca. Thank you, Sasha. That was amazing. And just to plug not only for the newsletter, but your website is amazing and has lots and lots of good data, including a link to uh, Becca's uh, new report. And Sasha, just love that you started with the soci socio historical perspective. That is so important. I learned so much and just want to underscore um, the livelihood piece, value, livelihood generation being integrated into your model, also so important. So while uh, Virginia is 
um, switching the controls over to Becca, let me just you know, introduce her briefly and say, you know, she's an assistant professor of agroecology at the University of California, Merced. She's in the School of Natural, Re Natural Sciences, Life and Environmental Sciences unit there. Becca's specialties include soil health, soil carbon and nitrogen cycling, greenhouse gas dynamics, compost, and so much more. She has authored numerous research papers and has been a part of the research team at the Marin Carbon Project. And in fact, I believe our last two webinar speakers have referenced her work in their presentations. And I learned uh, that Sasha and Becca first met more than a decade ago when when Becca was a postdoc with little funding and they stayed in touch. And about five years ago, Becca started collaborating with soil in Haiti to improve approach, improve approaches to composting human, human waste. So uh, Becca, welcome. And a reminder to all the participants that feel free to type your questions at any time into your GoToWebinar panel. So Becca, it's all yours. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you, Sasha, for that wonderful um, presentation and background. As many times as I've heard you speak your story and the story of Haiti and, and the solutions that you all have provided there through soil, it's just it's just really amazing and wonderful. And um, one of the things that I love as a researcher, as a scientist, is that I have this amazing privilege to, to wake up in the morning and think about what I want to work on and what kind of new knowledge I want to help bring into the world. And I'm really motivated by working with partners like soil to do um, research that's not only um, that's not only beneficial to the scientific community but also um, has is impactful and can help um, push push the boundaries of innovation and, and um, sustainable futures for us all um, so so with that um, just a bit just a very small bit about my um, my lab I'm here at University of California at Merced um, my lab we call ourselves the agroecology lab um, and one of the common themes that we have in many of our projects is this focus on looking at organic waste streams and rethinking them as resources and we do this in a number of different agroecology ecological contexts depending what the needs of that site are, what the needs of the partners in that site are. So we work on, on biosolids, uh, on biochar and compost in different kinds of ecosystems and looking at how manure can be most efficiently used in diversified farming systems. But what I'll talk to hear about today is really looking at how we're um, doing research to um, with soil to um, to bring some of that data that they that they need to um, to support the work that they're doing and to hopefully thinking about things like carbon offsets and, and just um, uh, optimizing their impact from the, from the science side of things as well. Um, so all of these projects, including our work with soil, we're really we're looking at this, this vision from uh, the systems that we often have now, which are very linear flows of nutrients and organic matter, which start from in, imports, um, inputs into agri agricultural systems, food that's consumed by people, and then ultimately lost in the forms of, of waste. And what we're really looking to do is close this cycle, um, take all of those embedded nutrients and organic matter that was wasted and lost to the environment and recycle it back in a way that's beneficial, not just for um, healthy beneficial sanitation, but also for a number of other important sustainable goals like um, public health, pathogen containment, um, food security, energy security, clean water resources, and climate change, which will be the focus of, of the work that I'm talking about today. And of course, this is a huge team effort. Um, uh, Sasha and I have been working together for five years. She's got an amazing team at Soil that that has helped us with every little piece along the way. Um, everything from you know making sure that we have transportation when we're down there to get to the sites and do the work that we need to do, but also we have uh, lab technicians that help run samples when we can't be there, and we have uh, climate and compost fellows, which are uh, local university students, um, which we. Pay a stipend um, for for their work to contribute to um, the collection of data and, uh, and of samples. Um, and I also want to specifically mention my former postdoc, Dr. Gavin McNichol. He's currently a postdoc at Stanford University. His background is in on methane um, emissions uh, measurements from, from a variety of different ecosystems. 
and he came into this project knowing about soil and wanting to do to do good with biogeochemistry um, and has done really amazing um, work uh, in my lab and uh, he actually submitted one of our papers today that I'll be showing some of the data from. Um, and so uh, when we think about climate benefits of ecological sanitation, um, the, the kind of sanitation that soil provides, we hypothesize that there are five different pathways of climate solutions embedded in this, um, in this sanitation service. The first is um, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions that can be achieved by converting from alternate waste fates. So if we um, can, if we, convert from a waste stabilization pond or some of those on-site um, services like pit latrines um, to composting human waste, we, we think we can actually, and we know from our data that we can actually reduce uh, a, a large amount of greenhouse gas emissions, which I'll, I'll show the data for. Um, we know that um, from other work uh, from Matt Reed's lab at Cornell, he um, documented the amount of methane that's produced from pit latrines. And what he found was even though these are, these are small individual um, distributed sources of methane, they're actually really potent um, sources of methane. And collectively, pit latrines account for about 1% of all anthropogenic methane emissions. That's a pretty big sliver of, of um, of the amount of methane that's that's put into the atmosphere from from waste. Um, so one uh, one way that we can solve climate change with this service is by avoiding the emissions that come from pit latrines, waste stabilization ponds, and other um, fates. Secondly, um, we can. Uh, capture, we can reuse that carbon that's captured, that organic matter that's captured um, and turned into compost by applying it to agricultural lands or to, um, to forested systems that are, um, that are needing to be re reforested. Um, this work builds on the work that um, I and others have done with the Marine Carbon Project. We've seen um, that a small amount of compost, just even a one-time application, um, can have a huge impact on the ability for a carbon to absorb and retain that carbon um, and to feed back to all those other co-benefits that you heard in Jessica's um, uh, webinar last time, um, including re retaining water and nutrients better and improving soil aggregation. So soil carbon sequestration is yet another way that uh, ecological sanitation can mitigate climate change. And um, the third way um, that ecological sanitation may mitigate climate change is by displacing some of the chemical fertilizers um, that are used in agricultural systems. Uh, the chemical fertilizers that we use are uh, produced by transforming an inert form of nitrogen in the atmosphere, N2, to uh, available or reactive forms of nitrogen. Doing that process, we've actually more than doubled the amount of reactive nitrogen, which is good because we need nitrogen to grow food as part of our bodies, um, but we use it very inefficiently and it's a very, fertilizers are very intensive, um, very greenhouse gas intensive um, um, practice. And in fact, fertilized agricultural soils are the primary source of anthropogenic nitrous oxide, making up about 80% of all the N2O that come from human activities. Um, and nitrous oxide is a very potent greenhouse gas. Um, one molecule of nitrous oxide can trap um, 265 times the amount of warming that one molecule of carbon dioxide can, uh, can um, result in. So that's yet another way that this uh, full cycle loop, closed loop system can mitigate climate change. And then the last two pathways are more adaptation pathways. Um, so we know that regardless of all the activities that we can do across the world, they, we see the impacts of climate change happening today. We're going to see them in the future as well, probably even more severe. So thinking about adaptation is a really important um, part of climate solutions. And ecological sanitation and the compost that's resulting from it can help um, agricultural systems and forested ecosystems adapt to climate change, by those other co-benefits that come from increasing organic matter. So it was said at the beginning of the webinar that um, soils have an amazing uh, ability to retain water with more organic matter and composting is, uh, adding compost to agricultural soils is, is one easy way to increase organic matter in the soil and therefore increase water uh, retention. 
Um, this also can feed back to crop production or, 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 or tree production. Um, so being able to buffer against drought stress and to increase the amount of food that's grown in a given area feeds back not only to climate adaptation, but makes a more food secure region of the world. Um, and lastly, um, the last adaptation pathway is by um, adapt, helping communities adapt to um, some of these really severe um, and catastrophic climate change impacts that we that we are seeing and we will continue to see, as Sasha mentioned very nicely in her presentation. Um, we So far, we haven't done the science behind all five of these, and what I'm going to uh, do is show you some of the, the main findings we have so far, but we're thinking about this um, collective life cycle approach to, to considering climate mitigation, uh, adaptation, and, and mitigation potentials. Um, so the questions that I'm going to touch on today are relate to mostly um, two of these um, pathways. So the first question is how much greenhouse gases are emitted during ecosand composting. Um, before our measurements there, we couldn't go to the literature or go to um, the IPCC reports to find uh, emissions factors or uh, projections of greenhouse gas emissions from this composting process because it's a it's a new process it's pretty innovative and so the science um, really wasn't there yet um, secondly we wanted to ask how does compost management affect comp uh, the greenhouse gas emissions that come from that composting process um, so we know that composting is a microbial process and the, the environmental conditions in the compost pile can create different environments for microbes that produce those different gases um, and lastly, kind of more on the adaptation side of things, we wanted to see what the impacts of uh, the application of this compost uh, would be on crop yields and soil water retention. Um, so uh, some of you may know this already, but just so that we're all um, have the same background. First, I want to just briefly explain why greenhouse gases are emitted during the compost process in the first place. Um, so we know that compost is a, is a microbial revolution. The microbes in there are doing the work um, as they're breaking up those um, chemical bonds in the organic matter. Um, they generate heat to, to heat up that pile. So it's a thermophilic process. Um, and um, in doing so, those microbes, different kinds of microbes, um, uh, respire different kinds of gases. So those microbes in doing their work for decomposing and stabilizing that organic matter in the process can also emit methane, nitrous oxide, and carbon dioxide. Um, those are all three greenhouse gases. Um, from a climate change perspective, we consider the carbon dioxide that's emitted from compost piles to be climate neutral because it's fast cycling carbon. The carbon, the, um, the, the carbon that's in um, food can, that, that's in food we eat, we poop out, and then if it goes back to the atmosphere, CO2, that's a pretty uh, short life cycle uh, and return trip back to the atmosphere for that CO2 molecule. But if that carbon is transformed to methane, which is more powerful at trapping heat, that's not considered biogenic anymore because it's it's changed in its form and it's functioning different in the atmosphere. Um, same with nitrous oxide. If that nitrous oxide is emitted from compost, um, it could be a net, in, uh, a net increase in um, greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. Um, so uh, in an aerobic composting process, um, we should see very little methane emissions because methane is a product of anaerobic microbial decomposition. Um, nitrous oxide can be emitted through both aerobic and anaerobic pathways, so we might see that um, uh, uh, in different ways uh, by those different microbial groups. Um, so essentially, those greenhouse gases are emitted by microbes, and so the environment of that compost pile matters a lot for fostering the best um, kinds of microbial populations. Um, we sample greenhouse gas emissions directly, so we're not we're not modeling or doing back of the envelope calculations. We're actually going out there and and measuring those emissions that come off those piles directly. Um, this is just an example. Um, uh, in any system, we use this kind of uh, this kind of. Uh, approach. We take uh, a stat, we call them static flux chambers. We built our static flux chambers out of locally available resources in Haiti. Um, soil had a bunch of, of buckets that we could we could use and um, and make into our our chambers. So basically, these buckets we cut the bottoms off, so they're capturing a headspace right above the compost. Um, 
we use this needle and a syringe right here to capture some of that headspace at a number of time points after we put that chamber on top of the compost. Um, those little glass tubes there are evacuated before we take our sample, so they have no air in them. And when we pull out a sample from that needle and the syringe, we put it into that glass vial, which we then take back and measure in the lab on an instrument called a gas chromatograph. Um, the, this, is an, uh, this graph here is an example of uh, of a flux measurement. So in each one of these samples that we collect, we measure the concentration and we do that over uh, on about a 30 minute time point and we can uh, calculate the flux uh, or the emissions of that gas by calculating the change in that concentration over a given amount of time. Um, and we do this uh, with a lot of replication in space and time because these gases have hot spots and hot moments. Um, so when we approached sampling um, these compost piles, we don't do it just one time um, or in one place in one pile. We do it um, several thousand times. In fact, we had about um, 8,000 of those vials that we had to evacuate and put samples into over the course of just one of the experiments. Um, so the first, the very first project that we did with Sasha was to um, do kind of a greenhouse gas survey. So this is a recent paper that came out in the Journal of Cleaner Production. I should say that it's um, the publisher. Um, it's not an open sor source publication. However, I am free to share this publication with anyone at any time. So if you would like a copy of this report, um, please feel free to email me. I'm happy to send it along to you all. Um, we also have a blog on soil website that kind of gives the, the brief summary for the results. Um, so I'm happy to share this information beyond this, this webinar as well. Um, so in this uh, first study, we did a survey of greenhouse gas emissions. We used these static flux chambers and we measured emissions coming from both of soils um, uh, uh, facilities, one in Port-au-Prince and one in Capation. They're managed it a little bit differently. As you can see, the, um, the site in Port-au-Prince does not have a roof and it has a soil floor. Um, the, the site in Capation has this roof and a concrete floor. Um, so those uh, differences can actually create a different environment for those microbes that are in that compost pile. So that's why we wanted to, to measure from both of them. Um, we also took direct measurements from um, waste stabilization ponds that were uh, nearby Port-au-Prince as, uh, as a measurement and, and comparison of an alternative waste fate. Um, and then lastly, we know that uh, waste is disposed of illegally in some uh, open fields. And so we knew uh, an area where uh, waste has been dumped for quite a while and we measured emissions from that uh, place as well. Um, and this is the, um, the punchline data from um, this, uh, this study. Um, this figure shows uh, the net greenhouse gas flux, all three of those gases, but uh, normalized into CO2 equivalents, taking into account their different global warming potentials. And at the bottom there shows each one of those sites. Um, and what we see is that greenhouse gas emissions were considerably lower from both of the compost facilities, especially compared to the waste stabilization ponds and the illegal um, dumping on that grass field. Um, <clears throat> the blue uh, bars here are methane and the red is nitrous oxide. Um, the next slide, I'm just going to show the same data, but shown a little bit differently to, to look at the relative proportion of nitrous oxide and methane. Um, so again, these are the different treatments that we measured from. And what we saw was that methane dominates the greenhouse gas footprint of those waste stabilization ponds. As Sasha, as Sasha mentioned, they're big, basically big vats of methane production and quite, quite large. Um, and then uh, we did see these quite a big difference between the net greenhouse gas size uh, between those two uh, compost facilities uh, and the relative contribution of nitrous oxide and methane. So we saw a lower greenhouse gas footprint in the Port-au-Prince site, which didn't have um, that concrete floor compared to their other site that did. And we saw actually a considerable amount of methane coming from um, for, from the site in Capation, even though it's an aerobic process. Um, so that led us to our next study where we thought about um, what uh, role management plays in uh, the total greenhouse gas footprint. So basically, how can we optimize management of these compost piles to get towards that lower end of the greenhouse gas footprint? 
even though both were favorable compared to waste stabilization ponds. Um, so this was a huge team effort. Again, we had a lot of hands on deck to do this. We took weekly samples for over a year. Um, uh, again, so we had replication in, in time. And then in space, we had a number of different piles that we measured from. Um, and uh, within each pile had a, a number of measurements because what we saw in our pilot studies with it, it was that there's uh, variability in the gas fluxes that come from the edge of the pile versus the middle of the pile. So what we were thinking is, is that we were seeing some anaerobic um, microsites within the compost that could produce that methane. Um, and so this is um, kind of a lot of data, but this is the data that we were very excited to see after um, after a couple years of, of work and, and thousands and thousands of, of samples that were run on the on the gas chromatograph. Um, this data shows three columns, uh, stage one, stage two, and stage three, re referring to the three stages of composting um, that soil has at their sites. So the first stage is that static thermophilic uh, stage that happens for about two to three months. At that time, the compost sits in a bin where um, it gets up to temperature and the pathogens are um, eliminated before it moves over to the next stage, which is the turning stage in which the material is turned every so often um, uh, to, to promote further decomposition. And then the last stage is that, that maturation or curing stage. Um, and what we see here is that, uh, well, first to note that the, the y-axis is, is scaled differently in each of these because the stages had very different flux, uh, magnitudes of flux. Um, so in, uh, in regards to um, methane, we see the largest flux occurring in that static thermophilic stage when the material is, is, is at its most wet, it's not being turned, so it's not aerated, um, it's at most risk for having some anaerobic microsites where that methane can be produced. In contrast, for nitrous oxide, we see uh, very little nitrous oxide at that beginning stage, and uh, we see most of the nitrous oxide uh, emitted during that turning phase where oxygen is introduced into that pile. By the um, curing stage, almost all of the emissions were not significantly different than zero. So at that time, um, that material is stabilized. We don't have a lot of, uh, of, a lot of microbial activity that's, um, that's emitting those gases. <clears throat> Um, so one, uh, oops, uh, one um, limitation to our first study is that uh, we didn't have information about the inputs of material or mass into the waste stabilization pond or into the compost piles at that time. So in the second phase of study, we knew that if we wanted to uh, compare across very different kind of waste sectors and to compare um, on a mass basis, we needed to be able to express these data a, a little bit differently. And that's not on a per area basis, but rather on a, um, a mass basis of the initial carbon or nitrogen um, so that we can express and scale up these, these units in a different way. So this data actually shows um, the results of our experiments where we test different management practices, but instead of showing the net greenhouse gas emissions flux measurements, um, these units are as a proportion of the initial carbon or nitrogen in the carbon in the case of carbon dioxide and methane, nitrogen in the case of N2O. So this tells us how much of the initial carbon or nitrogen is lost as one of these gases. Um, and what we see um, when we look at the data this way is that um, uh, the management does make a difference. Um, so when we tested the difference between having that concrete floor versus a, permeal so a permeable soil floor, uh, we saw that that soil floor significantly reduces methane emissions by more than twofold. And this is because um, that soil floor allows uh, more uh, movement of the water, kind of a draining um, of, of the, the water that's built up in some of those um, microsites in the compost and allows uh, airflow um, quite a bit better. And we did measure um, uh, reductions in moisture <clears throat> from that pile that had the soil floor compared to the concrete floor. We also tested the effect of the the thickness of the bagasse layer, so that material or uh, material um, that's made from uh, coarsely ground sugar cane that's added to the top. Um, and we looked at the thickness of that layer. And what we saw is that actually the in that static thermophilic phase, the thickness layer didn't really make much of a change for nitrous oxide or methane. But in the um, turning stage, 
we saw more than double the amount of nitrous oxide that's emitted. So there's a bit of a um, greenhouse gas pollution swapping. Depending on your management, you could you could increase methane while um, decreasing nitrous oxide or, or vice versa. So it's really important to have all of these numbers to compare um, and to evaluate um, the, the net impact of a particular practice. Um, so this was good news. Actually, when we shared this data with Sasha, she was excited because um, uh, our original hypothesis that was that that thick, thicker but gas layer might reduce um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but it, it you know our, we were incorrect there, so it's actually reverse. That's good news because that means less resources that are needed to uh, to manage that compost pile, and uh, sometimes but gas can be uh, a difficult resource to to um, to acquire for the composting process. So we know that uh, compost, uh, particular compost management can even drive down greenhouse gas footprints of these practices even more. Um, <clears throat> and this uh, table is a bit messy, but uh, we wanted to, um, outside of our own numbers, compare, compare um, soils composting process to other uh, non-sewered systems. So the data in this table, except for ours, which is in red at the top there, all of the other data comes from the IPCC emissions factors for different non-sewered sanitation systems. And what we see is that the methane emissions factors from composting human waste are one to two orders of magnitude lower than many of these other waste fates that are used, that are currently used at even larger scales in these informal um, settlements. Um, nitrous oxide, uh, we can see nitrous oxide uh, emitted compared to some of the other ones. We actually can uh, most times have a higher nitrous oxide emissions factor. So again, there's that trade-off between methane and nitrous oxide, both very powerful greenhouse gas uh, gas gases. Um, but in the last column here, um, we're looking at the global warming potential. So the net global warming potential um, is quite a bit lower than all of these other methods that are out there and currently used. Um, so we see this as a very promising uh, practice for reducing greenhouse gas emissions compared to other sanitation waste fates. Um, so the question always is, you know, what, what can happen if we scale this up at, at, at much larger scales? So we did some uh, scaling calculations to, um, to figure that out. Um, we considered scaling uh, compost at the city, regional, and global scales uh, based on population in uh, these ur informal urban settlements. And we also considered what fraction of that population's waste would be, uh, would be composted. So of course, if we have a higher fraction of the waste that's composted, we see the biggest gains in greenhouse gas mitigation. And I'm just going to put a little bit of numbers to this um, to this little heat map here. Um, so what we found is that um, uh, the per capita greenhouse gas mitigation uh, is equivalent to about 124 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per person per year. Um, if we extended this to all the in global informal settlements that are uh, on, in place today, about 1 billion people, um, that accounts for 4 teragrams of methane per year. And this uh, globally is, is important. It's equivalent to about 13 to 40 per 44% of our global wastewater methane emissions. Um, so this has a, a large impact in reducing emission, em emissions from from sanitation, at, uh, even compared to wastewater treatment plants. Um, but it, it's important to say that these mitigation potentials are just one of those pathways for mitigation. So far, we haven't included the, uh, the impacts of carbon sequestration or reduced emissions from fertilizer, which could, um, which could add to the mitigation potential even further. Um, we have, and I should say, we want to do the land application study. We haven't got there yet. We're hoping to get some funding for that. But in the meantime, we've brought it to the greenhouse and tried to understand a little bit about how those nutrients are cycled. Um, so these are some students that I had when I was at H University of Hawaii um, that worked on this greenhouse study. Um, so this greenhouse study, um, the goal of this greenhouse study was to look at uh, uh, compost from soil, compare that to other human waste uh, organic matter amendments and synthetic fertilizer, and basically measure the fate of that um, of the, all of those nutrients uh, in the soil, water, atmosphere, and in the, in the crop. Um, and because uh, the results of the Marine Carbon Project showed that a single amendment can have a long-lasting effect, we tried to look at that legacy effect too by planting um, our crops six times over in one pot, even though we only uh, applied all of those uh, amendments one time. 
Um, and what we saw is that uh, soils compost significantly increased crop biomass compared to synthetic fertilizer. This wasn't too surprising to us because these soils are deficient in many nutrients. So um, the urea in this case, the synthetic fertilizer only provides nitrogen, whereas compost provides a whole suite of macro and micronutrients. Um, and it fared well compared to even compared to other um, human waste organic matter amendments. But one thing that stood out for um, soils compost was this legacy effect. Um, so this shows um, all of these six consecutive cropping cycles um, uh, after applying that for each of these fertilizers only one time. And what we saw is that even though the other organic matter amendments um, uh, in, uh, continue to have some effect through time, compost was really, really stood out and it actually never came back down um, to the, the level of the control. Um, we actually intended on carrying out this experiment until we no longer saw treatment differences, but we just had to stop after, after um, about seven months because uh, it, it kept, uh, that compost had uh, kind of brought our, our soils to a new state, right? It, it, um, it, it wasn't just this, uh, the nutrients that were depleting, it actually improved soil structure, water retention, and so on. We measured a whole host of measurements. I'm not going to show them all now. I'm just, just going to show this, uh, this one figure showing that um, the amount of water that was leached or lost from the, these pots was significantly lower from compost compared to all of the other treatments. Um, so we can start to see some of those co-benefits pretty, pretty clearly um, uh, through time. Um, and with that, I'll just say that you know, sanitation affects local to global flows of water, carbon, and nutrients. Um, closing the poop loop can tighten those biogeochemical cycles. It can connect to sanitation and agriculture while addressing multiple sustainable development goals um, and uh, improving the livelihoods of, of, of communities. Um, and compost, um, when it's applied to agriculture, can imp improve soil function and increase crop production. Um, and safely managed sanitation, like soil, uh, can um, and is and should be a much larger used important climate solution. Um, and with that, I would like to thank um, all of the attendees and, um, and the organizers as well as Sasha. Thank you, Becca. That was amazing to take, you know, the you know, level of scientific research and present it in a way that anybody can really understand. Well done. And there's a couple of lines from you I'm just going to have to to steal. Uh, one is, quote, compost is the microbial revolution. Love that. And your last one, closing the poop loop. Have to use that one, too. So, um, when we do the next webinar, we have lots of polling questions, including Sasha's. Uh, how many of you have peed on your compost? So <laughs> we'll uh, get into some of some of that. For those of you who missed the beginning of the uh, the beginning of the webinar, that was a good one. So I don't know, Sasha, if you want to uh, have any closing remarks. Otherwise, we can move to Q and A. So Sasha, go ahead and and unmute, regardless. Um, okay, so Sasha, just jump there in we, if you want to say. No, yeah. I just, I very much would love to jump to questions. I know that we just gave a yeah. lot of information. Thank you so much, Becca, and I look forward to hearing everyone's questions. Yep, great. So we're gonna we're gonna get. There's still quite a, pe a lot of people who are still on the webinar. Thank you for staying on. We're gonna get to your questions. We're gonna do just a few um, polling questions, just two, um, now before people more people drop off. So the first one is uh, how inclined are you to, and you can select all that apply, start composting, learn more about composting, reach out to composters for additional information, and support composting if you're not like in the field. So um, give you a few seconds to, okay. About half of you have voted, just a few more seconds. All right, let's show the results. Um, so great, almost two thirds learn more about composting. Not everybody on the line is actually gonna be a practitioner, that's understood, but 86% uh, are gonna support composting. We need you, yes. And then the last one, the last polling question we're gonna do today is, as an overview of how one frontline community is using ecological sanitation and composting, to improve poor soil and build climate resilience. This webinar had 
too much information, the right amount, not enough. Um, select one. Okay. Gosh, I, I feel like we gave you everything under the sun here. I so. know. Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed it. We went from the socio-historical all the way through to the microbial. So. I know, right? Okay, let's show the results. So I think most people agree with you, Sasha, the right amount of information, but you know, people want to learn more. So uh, we need we need more, so always more. So on the um, landing page, the registration page, where we'll post the recording of this, we'll include any resources, including a link, uh, not to the direct uh, published paper, but to um, information on it where you can get it that'll have uh, Becca's email and any other resources that, um, and SOIL's website and how to sign up to their newsletter. So go to that. Okay, so let's dive into questions. So we had um, a couple of questions about, have you done any testing on medical pollutants or heavy metals in the finished compost? That's always, always a question we get from biosolids composting in the US. And so there were a couple people who, who asked about that. So I don't know. Um, Sasha or um, Becca, which one of you can address that? Sure, I'll, I'll step in for a moment and then pass it to Becca in case she has additional information. But we, we do test the compost regularly for all nutrients, including heavy metals. And we have never had a problem with heavy metal contamination. I think the, the reason for that is because a lot of the heavy metals issues associated with biosolids are because <laughs> We have a mixed waste sewer system in our country. So as we all know in our homes, you know, poop and pee are not the only things that are going into the sewer. So all of those household chemicals, any cleaning products that we use in our toilet, all of that is making its way into the sewers. And heavy metal contamination is coming primarily from those chemicals that are, are going into the system. In terms of pharmaceuticals, it's something I'm very interested in looking at. We we had a an early collaborator, um, Gabby Picora, who is now at the University of Davis, and she's doing a lot of research on pharmaceuticals and human waste. So I'm still hoping that we can build that collaboration over time. And Becca, if you have anything additional to add, jump right in. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, you, you hit the main points right. Um, I would only just add that during our greenhouse study, we also measured uh, heavy metals and uh, and other nutrients in, pl in the plants that were grown, and we didn't see um, plant uptake of heavy metals. We didn't look at pharmaceuticals, but yeah, I would also refer to Gabby um, Black Pakora's work for that. Great. And a related question, just in terms of like environmental impacts, is um, is there a concern around around impacting groundwater quality with composting directly on the ground? Ooh, I'm so glad this one got asked, and I will pass this one quickly to Becca because this is actually a follow-up study that we're doing. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I'm glad about this question. I didn't include it um, just for um, for time purposes for this presentation, but another study that we're doing um, is looking at uh, the uh, water that leaches underneath the compost piles if we have that permeable soil floor, um, the nutrients that are lost during that, and um, we're looking also at pathogens as, or as E. coli as an indicator for potential pathogen loss um, that could that could potentially contaminate groundwater. Um, and we're happy to say we did this study for 18 months at the Capation site. And we did see um, a, a few instances of E. coli that was um, that was detectable in the in the um, leachate we, after weekly you know weekly samples for 18 months. But we saw actually a higher occurrence of E. coli in our control site, which was outside of the footprint of sanitation. Um, so we're not sure exactly why we saw those. They didn't really correspond to the compost management or the dumping schedule or anything. So um, it might just be contamination of the larger region. Um, so that was um, pretty promising results. We are now continuing that study in the Port-au-Prince site, um, where we have an experimental plot with a soil uh, permeable soil floor. And um, so far we're in, I think, week 12 or 13 of that, and we have yet to see any E. coli um, present during that um, as well. So, um, so far we think that the, um, the composting itself, there's been a study by uh, Gary Anderson's lab that looked at 
um, the microbial community composition of fresh material that's in the buckets and then material um, during and after that thermophilic stage. And his com uh, microbial community analysis showed that um, those intestinal borne uh, pathogens are pretty much completely eliminated after that thermophilic stage. So we think what we're seeing happening in the groundwater is a combination of an effective composting process and then also that soil as a, as a pretty good filter as well. Um, so, so far our results are pretty promising. Great. Um, so I think this is a question to you, Becca, the, um, about the research finding with the difference in the greenhouse gas emissions between um, um, some of the uh, different fates. So the composting pile with a concrete based base appeared to have the same-ish level of greenhouse gas emissions as Pond 1. Is that accurate? If so, it appears they were comparable instead of the compost pile being less. Can you talk more to that? Um, yeah, so the, in the first study, yeah, so kind of our first survey, um, right, and so that first survey is what led us to doing those compost management trials because um, we saw, you know, basically these two facilities had um, pretty different greenhouse gas footprints. Um, the um, the one that had uh, that had a higher footprint, um, almost similar but slightly less to one of the stabilization ponds, um, had a uh, a large, about 60% of that um, uh, greenhouse gases were uh, methane. And with um, the composting process that soil does is an aerobic thermophilic process. So um, methane is produced only under anaerobic conditions. And if it was a truly aerobic process throughout, we would, we would not expect to see any methane emissions. Um, so we think that that um, had to do with that concrete base um, pooling up water and increasing the moisture of that compost pile and creating some anaerobic microsites where there, um, there's kind of this like perfect condition for, for methane, for those meth, uh, methanogenic microbes to to inhabit and then produce methane. Um, uh -huh. So that, um, yeah, that finding exactly led us to do uh, uh, 8,000 more samples basically on these experiments so that we could tease that apart a little bit. So that's a really great observation. And so what we'd like to see with these compost, um, with these compost piles is more like uh, what we saw in that first study where we have some amount of nitrous oxide and very, very little methane production. Okay. Um, I know we only have a few minutes left, so there are a couple questions that, um, and Sasha, I think you can answer this, is what happens to the urine in the Haiti system? The liquid, oh, I, the liquid I'd material. I'd be able to answer that, otherwise I'd be in trouble. <laughs> um, well, no, that's a good, that's a great question, and it's actually one of one of the things I'm quite regretful about as an ecologist is that that urine is actually users um, dump that into the soil or into a drainage canal in their community. And the reason for that is primarily economic and, and logistical. So it is, if anyone has ever peed into some container, you will notice how much volume of urine we produce every day, especially if we're hydrating well. Whereas our, our feces is a pretty small volume. So if we were to try to transport all of the urine out of the communities, it would increase our costs exponentially. And the reason that we focus on the solid waste instead of the urine is because the, the risk of disease is coming from the feces, not the urine. Urine in, is almost always sterile. There are some viruses that can survive in urine. Most of those have not been a public health issue in Haiti. So it was for public health reasons <clears throat> and economic reasons that we decided to focus on the poop. But it, it makes me very sad as an ecologist because much of the nitrogen is actually in the urine and we would like to find a way someday to capture that. There's a lot of great research going on around the world looking at how we can dehydrate urine on site. And I'm waiting for one of our amazing research partners to, to solve that problem. And as soon as they do, I will be very happy to take the nutrients from the urine. Yep. Um, uh, another question for you, Sasha, just on logistics is, what is the distance in miles between the city where the human waste is collected and the composting facility? 
Yeah, it's uh, it's 11 kilometers. And I'm actually, I'm glad you asked, like, because it allows me to wrap up coming full circle to something that Brenda talked about at the beginning, which is the important, uh, the importance of having dispersed and distributed systems. I think one of the challenges we have with human waste is that you, because it require, because it is so dangerous from a public health perspective, it requires a good deal of control over the, the treatment site, which means that you can't just sort of set it up in people's backyards and, and let them manage it as easily. Um, however, this is certainly something we're looking into in the future is how can we have different compost sites in, in different areas around the city so we can reduce that transport distance. I know we're at our scheduled time. Do you both have just a few more minutes? I'm not going to ask all the questions, but there's two more I would like to ask. Um, sure, I'm fine. Okay. All right, good. Thank you. Uh, so uh, one was, I would be interested in hearing whether this technology has been attempted at a larger scale, such as a town of 25,000 in, 25, inhabitants, or alternatively in a commercial cattle or poultry production site. Any thoughts on that from either of you? Yes, well it has and actually there is a great composting facility um, outside of Los Angeles called the Ayurka Composting Facility. It has another name as well which is escaping me right now. Um, but they actually take all of the all of the biosolids from Los Angeles and do compost them. Um, and then they, they sell that compost under a brand name which is also escaping me right now. Um, and then there's milorganite, which I think is made in Milwaukee, which is also a compost made out of human waste. So those systems are at a very large scale. They're different in that they are using um, waste that was collected in the sewer system. So again, it may have some of those problems with heavy metal contamination that we don't get. Um, we also have some great partners around the world who are working on composting of human waste. We have a a partner in Nairobi, Kenya, that does that, and also one in Accra, Ghana. Um, they, they're they sort of similar in scale to where we are right now, but but growing very rapidly. I think the the waste to resource movement is, is really picking up momentum. Um, so I, I anticipate seeing this at much larger scales in the coming years. Mm, that's so good to hear. So my last question, I'm sorry we didn't get to all of your questions. We will share the remaining questions with the presenters and see if we can get back to folks. Um, but my last question I wanted to ask uh, now is, were Haitians skeptical about using the finished compost for agriculture, knowing that it came from human excrement? And how did the soil team convince them of the benefits? Mm -hmm. That is a that that is a question we we actually get fairly often, um, and I understand because it's certainly a question that I went into this work with. Um, what we found, which is actually not surprising, is that the people who are using the compost are farmers or their backyard gardeners, and farmers in particular in Haiti are used to the idea of using waste to, to build soil. So they've certainly done it with animal waste, but we've also, we've met a fair number of farmers who have said to us, oh, well, of course. I mean, what do you think we do with our old pit latrines? We crash them down and we plant banana trees in them. And the most beautiful banana tree I have in my backyard is coming from my pit latrine. So I think farmers have, a much deeper understanding than those of us who are farther away from the land of how ecological nutrient cycles work and the importance of recycling all organic waste, even if they come from our bodies. Um, that said, you know, I think that particularly in the wake of the cholera epidemic, people are much more just conscious of the link between human waste and, and diarrheal disease. And so it is very important that we're able to share those test results and, and let them know that it's treated under controlled conditions and we test every batch before bagging it. I would say that it, most people don't require us to sort of get to that level of detail, but, but we always have that information on hand if they do need it. That's good, good. Um, so we had a question about how to get copies of the research and also Dr. Nichols, your colleague, Becca. So we'll put 
put all of that as links on the uh, landing website landing page for this um, webinar. And when we send out the recording, you'll have the link so you can check those out. We'll get those out to people. So thank you to all who stayed on to the end. And thank you, Sasha and Becca. Uh, terrific webinar. So um, good work. And we look forward to following uh, more of your work in the coming years. Have a good day, everybody. Thank, thank you so you. much, Brendan. Thank you. Thank you.